My name is Jessie Corcoran. I'm the Prevention Coordinator at WACASA. Um, I organized the Summer Prevention Webinar Series partially because um, it was very important to us to make sure that we gave these prevention education opportunities during the summertime. Um, we know that so many prevention educators are so busy during the school year, and so we wanted to provide this opportunity during the summertime. Um, Kelly Malipke was also helpful in, in uh, organizing this webinar. Uh, she will not be with us today on the webinar, but she is with us in prevention spirit. Um, so. I just want to uh, remind you folks about um, some of the other webinars that we had in this series. All of them have been recorded and are in are, are posted onto our website. Um, and just to know, this is the webinar that today that was um, originally scheduled for Tuesday, July 26th, but we had to uh, unfortunately to reschedule uh, due to illness uh, for August 9th today. So we're really, really excited to have Amanda and Blake with us from the Family Support Center. Um, they actually did a version of this presentation at our June Training Institute, and it was so awesome that I asked them to do it again in a webinar um, so that a few more people would be able to see it. So. Um, we're really, really excited to get started today. Um, just a note about the technology. If you do have any questions, please type them into the questions box. We are not going to answer them as they come in, but rather answer all of them at the end. But go ahead and enter your questions in that questions box as we go along, um, just to make sure that we don't forget any of them and you don't forget your questions, because that always happens to me. I always think I'm going to remember, and then I don't. Um, so go ahead and make sure that you uh, enter your questions in that box, and we'll answer them at the very end. Um, and again, if you have any feedback about this series or any ideas for future webinars for us, we would love to hear about it. Um, we really want to make sure that these uh, webinars and all these learning opportunities are reaching and meeting your needs. So please do feel free to provide that feedback to me. Um, my uh, email again is jessyc at wakasa.org. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Blythe and Amanda. Good morning, everyone. All right. Hi, folks. Um, again, this is Moving Pictures Using Film and Television in Sexual Violence Prevention Work. My name is Amanda Schumacher, and I am the Eau Claire Sexual Assault Outreach Program Coordinator with Family Support Center, which serves Eau Claire and Chippewa counties here in Wisconsin. Um, I started working in this field over 15 years ago, but I've been a fan of movies and television for well, pretty much my entire life. Um, my academic background is in liberal arts, and I spent some time teaching a film survey course for adult learners. But uh, until pretty recently, I was convinced that you know my passion for anti-sexual violence work and my passion for narrative media had to be mutually exclusive uh, for reasons that I'll get to in a second. In the past several years, though, I've really decided to challenge that assumption and started to look for ways to use my interest in film as a tool to help illuminate and clarify some really challenging topics around sexual assault. And um, if I ever needed help in rationalizing this wild idea, a little over a year ago I happened to cross paths with uh, a willing accomplice, and that is Blythe, who I'll let introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Blythe Newberg. I'm the Sexual Assault Victim Services Coordinator for the Family Support Center in our Chippewa Falls office. And I've been doing this work, I've been here for about a year, but I've been doing sexual assault advocacy in one capacity or another for about 10 years. And I got my master's in gender and women's studies, and I wrote my thesis, my whole, my capstone project was on a feminist interrogation of the films of Sofia Coppola. So I took a look at those films at a master's level through a feminist lens. So I've been working with sexual violence and film in one capacity or another for quite some time. Uh, so the reason for this webinar today is that film and television are, in a word, pervasive. People are definitely watching. And enough people are watching to support a multi-billion, that's billion with a B, dollar industry. People aren't just watching either. They're synthesizing and drawing conclusions and forming opinions based on the messages, so for better or worse. Um, so why shouldn't we at least consider using these resources to our advantage, especially if we, in the prevention field, can really help round out 
or even steer the conversations that people are having about the depiction of sexual violence in movies and TV. So today we're really hoping to boost your comfort in using film and TV as part of your prevention work, and we'll be discussing the benefits and drawbacks of doing this, how to evaluate media to make sure it's a good fit, ways to maintain safety of our audience while also preserving the impact of the whole uh, viewing experience. And finally, suggestions for actually getting started. Uh, right up front, though, I want to address a common misconception and what I think accounts for some of the hesitance that I've seen when I bring up the idea that TV and movies can be a resource for us in the anti-sexual violence movement. A lot of folks are committed to there being only two possible answers to the question, why do you or why do people watch movies and TV shows? And the first is to be entertained or as a form of escapism. I think we've all heard this one. Um, now we can understand why people who are in that camp get a little uncomfortable at the idea of film and television as a tool for sexual assault prevention. Uh, they might say, sexual assault isn't entertaining. If I want to escape the realities of the world, why would I want to watch media that just replicates these realities? And yeah, you know, absolutely, point taken. Uh, but there's another school of thought that says, well, I only watch films and television programs that will educate me and expose me to new ideas and different perspectives, which you know, is all very noble. Um, but maybe let's loosen the reins a little bit. Like, I love to watch hard-hitting, frontline documentaries as much as the next person, but if watching movies was meant to be completely onerous and awful, filmmakers wouldn't put so much energy into their craft. They wouldn't really need to work at courting audience with appealing qualities if it was just all about, you know, obligation to view. So, I this quote from uh, Brett McCracken to maybe help us move past that either or dichotomy. And he says, film is escapism, but we are not escaping from reality as much as we are escaping into a clearer, more focused understanding of it. And if you're still nervous, well, we're going to do our best over the next hour or so to help calm those fears, starting with some of the pros and cons of using movies and TV in sexual assault prevention work. And I'll hand it over to Blythe. Film and television can be beneficial because they both offer a depersonalized method to demonstrating sexual violence that audiences can view while still being totally detached from it. They can look at the case on the screen and know that it's not real people, but still see it as an example of similar experiences. Fictionalized film and television might show a more diverse and in-depth illustration of situations that audiences wouldn't necessarily see on the, on the news as well. They might be able to see their own ethnic background or gender identity in a film clip that they wouldn't see in a television news story. Um, seeing depictions of experiences of sexual assault in film can validate audiences' own experience and even prompt survivors to begin naming and claiming experiences that they previously may not have labeled as sexual assault. And this can be challenging or even hurtful. And we'll talk about that later on. Portrayals of sexual violence in film have the potential to trigger strong memories and emotions for those who have been personally affected by sexual violence. You know, obviously, because we didn't, when we're showing a film to a group, we didn't create the film, so we can't control the message. And we can't entirely predict the audience response either. All we can do is select a clip or an entire film that we feel will be most helpful. Um, the problem is that the selections of the films that are available, particularly if we're talking about mainstream American or Hollywood films, they don't always provide the best quality in terms of diversity. There are films that are made internationally or from independent filmmakers to choose from, and those are definitely better from my perspective, but they can be harder to obtain. Not every film clip or TV clip will be representative of every survivor's experience. So you may have a clip of a film that will be effective in one area, but not super helpful in another. Um, and also in terms of potential drawbacks, as I mentioned before, re-traumatizing is always a concern. 
we have to assume that there's always a survivor in the audience. Maybe it's a film screening to an, office, or an audience of 50 people, but we have to know that there are survivors in the audience who will be triggered by a vast array of scenarios. Objects, all different kinds of things, we'll get to those as well. And we just, we can't control every reaction to every image. Like Blythe mentioned, when we are using film or television as an educational tool, we can't totally regulate the response of our audience um, because there's always going to be these multiple compounding dynamics at play. And really, I mean, that's a risk that we run when we're using any kind of supplemental material in our prevention work. Um, but while complete control is not a reality, there are a few steps that we can and should take to make sure that we are choosing the best material for our intended purpose and also doing what we can to mitigate some of that potential harm. So when we're, when we're choosing a film or a television clip um, to use in prevention work, the first question we should ask ourselves is, who is my intended audience and how accessible is this film for them? Um, now, accessibility is a really loaded term and it can include a lot of factors. Uh, for example, language, that includes profanity, but the spoken and understood language and also language comprehension level of your audience is also important. We, we would also strongly recommend using subtitles or captioning whenever possible. I mean, even if you don't think that there are any deaf or hard of hearing people in your audience, um, captioning can just be beneficial for a, a wide swath of people. I am not hearing impaired, but I love a good subtitle. Absolutely. I really do. Absolutely. Uh, cultural relevance. Again, this, this term carries a lot of meaning. Um, a lot of times audience, audiences can kind of mentally transpose the experiences that they're seeing for ones that are relevant to their culture. But this also just has the potential to create an additional barrier, and that would be at best. At worst, it could be alienating for the viewer or make them feel othered if the material was not culturally relevant to them. We want to as well be mindful of nudity or sexual content, and then actual depiction of sexual violence or other forms of violence on the screen can be something that we should really keep in mind when selecting our film that's appropriate for the audience at hand. Uh, so here's an example of a film that we have used in the past. Uh, Mysterious Skin is one that we've used in conjunction with Sexual Assault Awareness Month programming. And with this, we had to be so, so deliberate in planning around the screening, especially when we were considering impact on the audience. On one hand, I, I do think that this is an extraordinarily valuable piece of cinema for sexual assault prevention and outreach. Roger Ebert, folks might remember him. He was just such a, you know, respected film critic. He called Mysterious Skin the most harrowing and strangely the most touching film I've seen about child abuse, which is pretty high praise. And then I personally credit the novel on which Mysterious Skin uh, was based with inspiring me to pursue work in this field. So it's about the aftermath of childhood sexual abuse and shown through the lenses of two male survivors in rural Kansas. They process their shared trauma very differently. It just distills a ton of complex information around the ways uh, childhood trauma does and doesn't inform adult sexuality, and it's just very clear and easy to follow. But for all those positive characteristics, Mysterious Skin is definitely not a general audiences type of film. Uh, Blythe is laughing when I say that. <laughs> uh, so to put it mildly, uh, it's photographed in a very confrontational way with a subjective camera, so the audience feels like they're really in it. And there's profanity, nudity, violence, including an extremely graphic scene of adult sexual assault. So when we approached using this film, we thought long and hard about the audience for this material and decided to screen it in partnership with the university as part of uh, an existing queer film series. So we marketed it to a demographic that would be 
kind of more versed in cinema and cinematic convention and wouldn't be so hostile to the difficult material. But even so, we did put a bunch of additional safeguards and supports in place for the audience, and we're going to describe some of those later. Another question we might want to ask when we're selecting a film is, what concepts do I hope to communicate to viewers? And asking this really goes hand in hand, I feel, with the whole audience question, too, because we need to make sure that these mesh well. Um, some points to consider include how clearly does the TV show or movie portray these concepts. So a little anecdote, there's a film I like quite a bit, uh, Shame, directed by Steve McQueen, that I would probably never use in prevention work for quite a lot of reasons, actually, but mainly because the idea that the main character and his sister experienced some kind of childhood sexual abuse is heavily alluded to, but it's never stated outright. And I don't think it would really be fair to make viewers extrapolate out that far. So we want to really look for clarity. And also, what context is needed to guide viewers? So does it bear more explanation than time allows? If you need like a genealogy chart or maybe a mini seminar on the Marvel Comics universe for viewers to follow along, it, it may not be the best choice. So when continuing to ask questions in terms of what would be something Film. When showing a film or television example to an audience, we want to, we have to first consider if the depiction of sexual violence or its aftermath is in fact victim-centered. So what does that mean? Does the film demonstrate sexual assault from a victim's perspective? Is it realistic? Is it necessary for the film to include the violence? Does it move the plot forward? Is it done, or is it done in a way that makes it completely unnecessary and superfluous? The trouble with sexual violence in film and television is that it's often displayed in a titillating or sexualized way, and we don't often see sexual assault for the graphic, disgusting, demoralizing act that it is. And we'll see examples about that on the next slide. So looking at the top box on the, the, on the right, we have a still from a film directed by Sam Peckinpah. It's called Straw Dogs. A lot of people respect and admire this film for its quality. I even like this film. But the issue I take with it is the way in which the sexual assault is portrayed. In this movie, the, the rape is very sexy. It shows the victim being almost turned on by the violence. And that's a dangerous way to use sexual assault as a plot device. It's not victim-centered. It's erotic for the audience, which is something sexual assault should never be. Um, additionally, the Game of Thrones, which is a show that I'm sure everyone has at least heard of on HBO, it has a surprising amount of sexual assault in it, and it's garnered a lot of negative press from folks who say it features sexual violence in an un to an unjustifiable degree. Maybe a lot of the sexual assault is totally unnecessary. And Amanda, you should talk about The Virgin Spring, because I've <laughs> never seen it, but I love Igmar Bergman. Yeah, uh, so The Virgin Spring, that might be less concerning than the other examples, um, although I should mention it did serve as the inspiration for the horror film Last House on the Left, which is a really lurid Ooh. rape revenge film, and we would definitely not recommend ever, ever, ever using that in prevention work. Nope. Um, yeah, so digression aside, back to The Virgin Spring, it, it, it's a great film on many levels, but it does decenter the victim's experience, and it focuses more on sexual assault um, as a symbol and also the shattering effect that the, the victim's assault has on her father's religious faith and sense of morality. And so is this necessarily a bad thing? No, no, uh, not at all. But it's definitely worth considering when selecting a film, especially if that message does not align with your overall purpose. So asking more questions, another important one is, does the narrative depict sexual violence in a problematic way? So kind of continuing with the same theme as we talked about with the film Straw Dogs. And frankly, I see this over and over again in film and television. 
problematic ways that sexual violence is demonstrated. It's, it's dangerous when sexual violence is there to be erotic or sexy. Anytime we see a rape where the victim appears to be enjoying it is not going to be helpful for a survivor of sexual violence, as you can imagine. I also hate it when the victim in a sexual assault scenario seems to fall in love with their perpetrator. It's just something that's not going to be useful for a prevention educator to be showing to audiences for whom we want to dispel myths about sexual violence. Plus, potential survivors who are viewing the movie or TV show probably don't want to see that, and understandably so. Here's a question that Blythe's last point raises. So is it ever okay to use problematic material? So when we're doing that to underscore some of these myths and misconceptions that we're trying to educate people about. Um, and in answer to that, we're going to go ahead and say yes, but, meaning proceed with caution. So Blythe and I are big proponents of media literacy and think that it can be very instructive for audiences to see just how widespread some of these negative, harmful tropes are and to really start interrogating what they're watching. Um, the caveat is we must be really transparent about our motives for using problematic material. We have to stress that we don't, don't endorse the content, of course. Uh, for one, it's not respectful to survivors to just spring something on them that will likely only reiterate the same shaming and blaming and minimizing attitudes that they've encountered in real life. But I also think that it, it can be disrespectful to general audiences to kind of bait them and make them feel guilty for responding in a way that they've just been conditioned to respond. Um, so like, oh, oh I noticed you laughed at that rape joke in that clip. Well, consider yourself to be contributing to rape culture. <laughs> That's not going to be helpful to anyone. So uh, again, really be upfront with your objectives when you're using problematic material deliberately. Uh, before we move on, there's one more topic I want to cover. We've been talking a lot about movies and TV shows with actors, so depicting fictional or fictionalized narratives. And inevitably, people bring up, oh, I saw this awesome documentary that deals with sexual violence in some way. Uh, Rape in the Fields, The Hunting Ground, Out in the Night, those are just a few examples. And all three of these do an amazing job with their subject matter. So documentaries can be used in prevention work, although we might need to consider them in a slightly different light. So first, we can look at the benefits. Documentaries give actual or real-world examples, and that can lend credibility to our message. And they may offer proof, and that's in heavy quotes, that some viewers need to assure that the issues we're talking about are real. So we can talk in generalities about concepts and offer statistics and anecdotes, um, things that support our statements. But sometimes it just takes this multiplicity of voices from experts and survivors and whoever to, to sway someone's thinking. And then as with anything, we found that there are some drawbacks to using documentary as well. First, uh, documentaries can just lack the appeal that comes with recognizable actors and Hollywood production values and so forth. I, I love documentaries. Um, because I watch a lot of them, too, I, I understand how engaging that they, they can be. But many audiences might hear the word documentary, and then they're instantly transported to some dry educational film that they had to watch in ninth grade health class. And you can really lose your audience that way. The last drawback is it's a little more uh, challenging to grasp. but we should keep in mind that with documentaries, some viewers, for some reason, just really get hung up on interrogating the factual truth. So they seek out these minor inaccuracies in the material. And there's been heated debates about what documentary is and what it's perceived to be. And documentaries, though, they do have a ton in common with fictional films. Um, every time a filmmaker makes the decision about what to film, so what to include in the frame, when, for how long, that, that's an editorial choice. And the filmmaker is manipulating reality to suit their own vision. 
But when viewers hear the word documentary, they sometimes want it to conform to some idea of factual purity or absolute truth. And when that doesn't happen, even super small inaccuracies can cause viewers to call, call everything into question. I've had these viewing experiences that start to feel like jury trials, like, oh, the victim said the perpetrator had a birthmark to the right of his nose, but we can clearly see it was to the left of his nose. And when that happens, it can just totally derail an otherwise productive conversation. So all things to keep in mind when, when using documentary film and your prevention work. All right, so we've already talked about how important viewer safety is to us. It's something that we don't want to downplay at all. In fact, even after taking all possible precautions, you still have nagging concerns for the emotional safety of your audience. We'd rather you held off on using the film or TV clip in that instance. But that said, there are a lot of ways to look out for viewers. Um, one of them is a trigger warning, which I'm sure everyone listening to us right now has heard of. I think trigger warnings are becoming more and more expected with regard to film and television. I see them often, I hear them often, especially when I'm in groups or communities with known survivors. Essentially, a trigger warning is when you say to the audience, there may be some things in this film that are unsettling or offensive, and you may get uncomfortable during parts of it, and it's okay for you to excuse yourself, get a drink of water, Catch your breath, do what you need to do. If you need to take a break from watching the film because you're triggered by something, it's totally fine. In other words, a trigger warning is a way to literally warn someone if they are about to see or hear something that may upset them or bring about memories of their past abuse. But the problem with this is that many triggers are completely unpredictable. Of course, we'd expect a scene to be we expect the scene to be triggering. It may even be upsetting or uncomfortable for someone who is not a survivor of violence. But a trigger can be anything. Amanda and I have talked about this often in our work. For example, we could be working with a survivor whose abuser always hurt them after work. And maybe his work uniform was a blue shirt. And now every time that survivor sees a blue shirt, they think of their abuse. And from this perspective, triggers can be near impossible to predict. There's no way to know what is going to trigger one person when or another person another time, but we can do our best. I mean, that's, that's all we can do when showing film and television to audiences. Additionally, providing a trigger warning can really put people on edge because it assumes right up front that there will be content in the film that will be harmful. I think it's harmful to assume for the survivor that they will be upset by the content of the film. Letting a survivor decide for his or herself what's hurtful is best, because essentially no film or TV show is ever going to be risk-free. There's going to be something that triggers someone almost every time. So one alternative to using trigger warnings is to instead use content notes. Content notes acknowledge that the material can be challenging or unpleasant for any viewer, even if the material does not necessarily rise to the level of triggering a trauma survivor. Content notes also give us the opportunity to include information about other disturbing content, which we support because it acknowledges that our viewers are multidimensional people and it doesn't create an artificial hierarchy of trauma with sexual violence being at the top. So noting content like racism, homophobia, ableism, we've even seen cultural appropriation and colonialism, um, that can get viewers Get, it'll get them in the right headspace for watching the film or the clip. Um, so yeah, definitely seriously consider noting features that aren't limited to, quote, just sexual violence. Um, but you know, in the interest of time and preserving some of the impact of the viewing experience, we all have to decide individually where to draw the line. And that's always a judgment call, and it's one that we might mess up on. Um, I, I laughed at a content note that I saw once for uh, sea creatures. It was in a movie about mermaids. So not to make light, of course, there could be an audience mem member who had a genuine phobia of human-fish hybrids or something. But is that going to be universal enough that we should note it? Or is it just going to kind of cloud the true purpose 
of content notes. And again, to reiterate, we can't say this enough, no film will ever be risk-free in every respect. And that brings us to how to offer content notes. And again, how to go about this is really variable depending on uh, venue, audience, the time available. When I taught the film survey course and I had an entire semester with my students, I'd invite each of them individually and privately to discuss what their needs were in terms of content notes and trigger warnings. So with me one-on-one. -on -one. And I could really plan to capture and respond to those unanticipated ones, like you see creatures or you know, like that blue shirt example that Blythe gave earlier. But this was in addition to notes in the syllabus and on course materials about more obvious content like sexual assault or suicide. Uh, however, I'm going to acknowledge that most of us don't have the luxury of spending that much individual prep time with our audiences, so we'll have to keep it brief. Um, that's where using both print and verbal content notes can be helpful. You might have a small display piece like I think I have one here, uh, so like the one pictured, and briefly reiterate the statement before the start of the film. Uh, how specific or general you need to be, that also depends on those uh, features that we mentioned, so venue, audience, time. I'd say that uh, unless there is content that you are extra concerned about, um, you, can, you can use precise generality is to describe the content. And I know that precise generality sounds like a contradiction, right? Um, but here's an example. So um, you could uh, note, make a, make a content note that really speaks to the nature of the content. Like this film includes discussion of child sexual abuse but does not depict any children being abused. So there are a few words of caution that we want to talk about, again, with navigate, navigating content notes. Um, content notes before a film can be helpful, but as you may have noticed, they're kind of tricky. They can push people away from engaging with the film or a TV clip without giving them a full understanding of what the realities of the film actually are. And I've had this experience myself. If I'm starting to watch a movie on HBO, and at the beginning of the film, during the TV ratings, I see that there's a letter R for rape. I have chosen in the past not to watch it all. Just seeing the word rape, getting in the information that this film will have a rape in it makes me not want to watch it. I said to myself, well, you know, if I'm going to watch something else if this has rape, because I don't need to see that. When a content note is so brief, like a single letter R for rape, or a short phrase, they can also confuse viewers by warning of content that isn't really there, at least at the level we might anticipate. So for example, last fall, Amanda and I presented a brief discussion after a film at the Eau Queer Film Festival, which is an annual LGBTQ film festival at UW Eau Claire. There were content notes about family violence before a documentary we attended. And in all actuality, the film did not show or mention sexual abuse in it or any other kind of hands-on violence. It instead was a documentary about LGBTQ youth, some of whom came from less than supportive homes, where they may have faced varying levels of rejection. So we went into this film thinking that there was going to be rough, triggering, difficult discussion about sexual violence and child abuse, and really there was none. It's possible that pieces of the film would have been triggering to some people, but and probably some viewers, we had been bracing ourselves for a portrayal of family violence that matched our understanding, and it never materialized. On the opposite end of things, in cases when the content note isn't adequate and viewers end up feeling triggered or traumatized, we should ensure that there's a backup plan, that viewers know that they can leave at any time for any reason, and ideally, there is a trauma-informed advocate present to help them talk through the experience. So where do we begin? Uh, hopefully you're not scared off. I hope you're also with us. Because now we're getting to the fun part. 
suggestions for how you can incorporate film and television into your prevention work. Um, if you are planning to use a film or TV example in a presentation, it's generally better to only use a clip. Keeping it to 10 minutes or less will get your point across and lead you into a discussion faster than showing an entire film. That is a film screening, and we'll, we'll get into film screenings in a moment. You'll also want to use a clip that isn't going to require a ton of backstory. Like, an example would be, well, what you need to know first before even watching this is that so-and-so is married to the guy in the green sweater, and they've been having a tough year, and her mother died, and you should know that before you hear what they're saying so that you'll see why this is useful. I mean, if you have to set up the whole scene and go on and on before people even watch it, it you should probably just pick a different one. A clip that really stands on its own is best, and it will be more impactful. But be mindful what you're choosing and for whom. Tailor the film to the film example to the specific audience that you're presenting to. It also helps to have a discussion guide or maybe even a list of questions passed out to the audience ahead of time so they know what to look for. So this is an example that I like to share. Um, when I talked about using a short clip, well, this is an example that completely contradicts that, but bear with me. <laughs> I teach a course on healthy relationships at a local high school during the normal school year. The students in the class are at-risk teens who have struggled to attend and get good grades at the, quote, you know, regular high school. So they attend this alternative high school instead. Often my students in healthy relationships have endured domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, neglect or they have witnessed any of those abuses. Also, they typically have substance abuse issues themselves, either their own or those of a parent or a caregiver. So there's a lot that goes into working with these kids to begin with. The Healthy Relationships course that I teach provides conversations about mental health, coping, good communication, so they can learn the differences between healthy and unhealthy relationships. So every year in this course, I show the entire film the perks of being a wallflower because it has amazingly accurate portrayals of teenage mental health concerns, sexuality, bullying, sexual abuse, self-acceptance, and discovery. It's a really well-made coming-of-age story. Um, and it's also kind of cool that the director of the film is the author of the book upon which it's based. So the film is just as good as the book and no stone is left unturned in terms of plot development or character information. So basically this is a great movie. Um, at the beginning of the film, I pass out a study guide that I wrote asking my students discussion questions about the behaviors of the film's characters or asking for the students' opinions on dialogue between characters. I always show about an hour of the film and then stop for 30 minutes to have some analysis and discussion and kind of allow them to process what they've seen before the end of class. So that gives them an opportunity to think about it and talk about it before they're pushed out of the classroom and on to the rest of their day because there are parts of this film that require a little bit of discussion. They get a chance to share their opinions and ask questions if there's something that they didn't understand. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is a good example of how to use a film to reinforce lessons about the dynamics of sexual violence because it illustrates many of the topics we've covered in class all semester long. So I love it. I show it every year. Yeah. Good example, Blythe. Uh, and Blythe mentioned hosting a film screening. That's the second thing we're going to talk about as, as an option. And it's honestly often the first option that comes to mind when folks start thinking about using media as a prevention tool. And it, it is, for sure, a really engaging option for us to use. Um, so start, when you're thinking of hosting a film screening, start by focusing on what we discussed earlier and really working to select an appropriate film based on your target audience and also the message that you hope to convey. Uh, all right, so this might call my qualifications as a true film geek into question, but I'm also going to recommend using movies that have some star power behind them um, or that are familiar to viewers in some way or, or basically offer 
any appealing quality beyond being a movie about sexual violence because you know, that's always a tough sell. Uh, one, one really important point to remember, you know, please digest this, is that I don't want to see any of our nonprofit agencies on the hook for fines. Um, is that when you show a movie in a venue that's open to the public, there are often royalty fees and other restrictions that are attached to it. And it can get really expensive. So we have learned that there are ways to work around this, to kind of circumvent these potential fees. And one way is to partner with another institution, like a school or a library, or a school library, um, to host a film screening. And the way I understand it is that a lot of schools, universities, libraries often have a subscription service that allows them access to a catalog of films for a flat rate annually. Uh, but in any case, I would definitely recommend utilizing the knowledge of a librarian uh, when you're researching the details on any royalty fees that, that we might be working with because it's a question they've definitely, definitely come up against before, and they are so helpful. We love librarians. Love librarians. Uh, you might even decide, or you might even find uh, that certain films have lower fees or even waived fees when they're used by nonprofits for educational purposes. But it's important to always check into it and, again, enlist those librarians because we can't be expected to know, you know how to navigate this entirely on our own. Finally, uh, as we described earlier, it's a great idea to have a trained advocate on hand during and after a screening to provide crisis intervention. Viewing a film can be an extremely visceral experience. And even with the best and most thorough content notes, certain viewers will react strongly in ways that even they hadn't anticipated. And we, we've done a few uh, film screenings as an agency. This year, actually for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, Family Support Center partnered with the Eau Claire Public Library for a screening of the movie Spotlight. And for those of you who might not be familiar with this film, it's based on the true story of the Boston Globe journalist who investigated and reported on the epidemic of clergy abuse in the Boston Archdiocese. And so the stars aligned so well, so well for this screening to happen because Spotlight had won the Academy Award for Best Picture just a month before, before we hosted this screening. And it was also still showing in some second-run theaters in the area. Um, but also because of this, when we approached the library, we were kind of concerned because it was so new and popular and getting all this positive press that it was going to be unaffordable. I, I really have to credit the filmmakers of Spotlight. Uh, when our librarian contacted the distribution company and explained what we wanted to do, why, we're, why we were using the film, they said that there were no fees associated with groups and organizations screening it, you know, as long as we didn't charge admission. Uh, typically, the, the librarian told us that a film like Spotlight would have cost upwards of $1,000 to screen. So we really stumbled into something amazing. And that also gave me this additional layer of reassurance that we selected a film that was so well suited to our purposes because the filmmakers were clearly invested in, in us using this as a teaching tool as well. And we had a pretty robust turnout, I think, of community members. And the majority of them stayed for the post-film discussion and they contributed. Uh, they were very insightful. Uh, in retrospect, I will say that it was especially important of us to have considered discussion around some of the secondary themes of the film. So this is something you'll want to keep in mind. Uh, not just child sexual abuse, but folks were very interested in clergy abuse and even more specifically in the Catholic Church's response to abuse survivors. So we could have probably even uh, done better and gone further in preparing materials 
or preparing remarks around those topics. But we, we did have materials. At least we had the foresight to bring those. So um, we included in our display before the film some supplemental materials from SNAP, which is the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, and that's a group that's featured prominently in Spotlight. So we had those at our information table, at least. So we're thinking uh, a little bit further about having someone else there at the film to kind of supplement a film discussion. Um, providing experts who can speak to the content of the film is good, too. If a group outside your agency, for example, um, like a film festival or a high school or college class or even some other community club or organization is screening a film that deals with themes related to sexual assault, it can be helpful to bring in an expert who has professional experience with the content of the film. Because Amanda and I are both trained sexual assault victim advocates, we have been invited to speak at other groups' film showings, and more often we've sought out the youth screenings in our community and offered ourselves as a resource. Having an expert on hand can lead respectability to the film and also provide additional content and information during a discussion session after the film is ended. If you are asked to be a speaker after a film, try to meet with the person organizing the event in advance to make sure that your vision for the discussion meshes well. So it's helpful to see the film beforehand. <laughs> you know, you might want to you might want to do that. You might want to watch it before the screening. Um, plan on some talking points or some questions to ask specifically to the audience to get a, a good conversation going. Kind of plan ahead of time what some of your remarks and questions will be. And again, providing materials like fact sheets, brochures, web addresses, and even local resources for the audience to follow up with after the film is a good idea, too. In case the film inspires further examination and people are really fired up about the topic and they want to learn more, they can do so. So I talked a little bit beforehand about our experience at the Oak Queer Film Festival. Um, we spoke after a couple films that were screened there, and this is something that Amanda has done on her own, too, for the past several years. We had an information table of resources from the Family Support Center and offered one-to-one -one counseling after the film. So if anyone was triggered by the content or just needed to talk, we were there not only to provide remarks from our professional perspective, but also just to be supportive of viewers. Yeah, and I, I know I mentioned how kind of tripped up we got when one of the documentaries we facilitated the post-film discussion for turned out to be not about the kind of family violence that we thought it would be. And that's a perfect example of why clarifying those expectations with organizers and really familiarizing yourself with the content and seeing the movie, um, those are all a big plus. Honestly, that was all on us. Luckily, we, we think pretty well on our feet, I think. So we, yeah. we, we pulled it off without any major hiccups. Uh, it, and I should say, too, even if you aren't as fortunate as we are and don't live in a place where a film festival like this might happen, definitely stay alert for smaller, kind of similar opportunities. I know uh, a lot of high school classes show the movie ad adaptation of the novel speak as part of their English curricula, and you know, who knows what else? I mean, maybe there would be a Scandinavian heritage group that's going to show the girl with the dragon tattoo, <laughs> um, or a Japanese language club could screen um, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon, right? So find a way to hit yourself onto that. Our last example of ways to incorporate media, so film and television, into your prevention work is using momentum. So capitalizing on the publicity surrounding a popular movie or television program dealing with themes related to sexual assault is just an excellent way of using the momentum behind a given piece of art and shaping community dialogues to reflect the messages that we as prevention workers want to put out there. So you can use this approach when the content of a film or TV show is handled well, or when it generates controversy. And that latter example 
is where some of that problematic material we talked about could actually be a big asset. So unlike other approaches, this doesn't necessarily involve actually watching the film or TV show in question with an audience. Instead, you could try something like uh, you know, writing an editorial, newsletter article, or a blog piece. Or you could organize a presentation, panel discussion, or a community forum inspired by the movie or TV show's theme. Um, if we all probably remember a couple of years ago when, when the movie of Fifty Shades of Grey had everyone talking. Uh, so you could write a newsletter article using that controversy as a springboard for discussion about, um, about consent, about intimate partner violence. Or another example, when uh, the, the Netflix show, Orange is the New Black, tackled the topic of sexual violence in prison. So we could take that opportunity to host a presentation that shines a light on the challenges facing real incarcerated survivors of sexual assault. Um, earlier this year, so the second season of American Crime aired. And American Crime is this anthologized drama on ABC TV. Uh, it's from John Ridley, who's the executive producer, and he's also a famous screenwriter. Um, it, it's one of those shows that keeps some of the members of the cast, like Lily Taylor, Regina King, Felicity Huffman, Timothy Hutton. You might be, recognize some of those names. Um, it, it keeps them on from season to season, but puts them in different roles and in different scenarios. So, like this time around, the, the main plot hinged on a young male student who was the victim of an alcohol-facilitated sexual assault perpetrated by the co-captain of their private high school basketball team. It kind of borrowed some of the themes from the real-life story of the Steubenville sexual assault. Um, and, you know, it was just doing a phenomenal job with this material. It married just very seamlessly all these issues related to race, class, gender, sexual orientation, mental health, and it was striking the right tone uh, repeatedly. Like every week I would watch and wait for the other shoe to drop. Like when is this going to do something problematic? When, it, when will it get bad? And it never did. And I was talking about it uh, pretty incessantly, maybe, on social media. And so a few of my friends and colleagues, and maybe they were sick of hearing this endless loop of enthusiasm, they encouraged me, like, oh, you should write about that show. And, and so I did. Um, I wrote a blog post for the Huffington Post Art and Entertainment section. And as the title suggests, you can see it there, it looked at what American crime gets right about sexual assault from the perspective of someone you know, working in the sexual uh, anti-sexual violence movement. Sometimes I think that the, like the negative pylon following a bad portrayal of sexual assault related topics garners more attention. But I also really feel it's important to kind of catch them doing good. So then hopefully our positive feedback will encourage more of the same. And it, it turned out that this piece really did have a lot of traction. Um, it, a lot of folks read it. It was shared on social media by the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, um, MaleSurvivor.org, Sex Signals, um, and other advocacy groups like uh, Wakasa, for example. <laughs> so I think that's a fantastic, uh, you know, real-life example of using the momentum of popular media in our own prevention work. All right, so thanks everyone for sticking with us. We just wanted to leave you with some parting thoughts, and then if there's time, um, and if you've you know, submitted any questions to Jesse, we'll definitely tackle those. So just a couple of extra final thoughts. Um, if there's a film or television program that you think has great potential for use in prevention work, find a way to use it rather than trying to seek out media that fits a narrow parameter. So if you have a situation that you would like to adapt a film piece to, that might not work as easily as finding a clip first to give as an example of something that you're thinking of. Um, 
I also wanted to mention that it, it's really crucial to be honest about what doesn't work about certain pieces of media to shift the audience's focus away from that fault finding, especially if they are just getting comfortable with the idea of media being used in this capacity. Um, and if possible, do this in advance of showing the film. Um, if we use the example of Perks of Being a Wallflower, you might say, like, I know that this movie does not depict many or any use of color, uh, and that's really unfortunate, but we still believe that it's worth watching for and then the following reasons. Uh, similarly, if you're watching a film and it gets called out by an audience member because of something you hadn't anticipated, just resist the urge to get defensive. You didn't make the movie. Um, you can validate their concerns and also reiterate your reasons for using the film or the clip. Uh, and once again, here's, here's our buzz phrase for the webinar, no tool or resource, resource we use will be perfect. And just on a personal note, I just wanted to say that it's okay if you watch or enjoy problematic movies or shows. I mean, I, I'm assuming that everyone listening is a sexual assault advocate or works in some form of a violence prevention, um, but you know, don't beat yourself up if you enjoy movies like Straw Dogs, which I mentioned earlier, or if you happen to be a horror film buff. Um, it's, it's, you're not a bad advocate or a bad person if you like problematic films, and reassure your audience of this too. Media literacy is about empowering, not shaming. Um, but also recognize that you're not going to find an immediate home for every film or TV show that you love in your work, and that's okay too. Some media is just more challenging to use in a prevention capacity, given all these parameters that we have to work around. And you might have to put some movies or television shows on the proverbial shelf indefinitely. But if you ever want to talk to someone who gets this uh, and whose passion for this stuff matches your own, well, you find us, and if you don't, here's our contact information. So call us or email us to talk about movies, to talk about sexual violence or anything, because those are my two favorite topics. Yeah, and with that, we're going to turn it back over to Jesse to see if there's any questions we can answer. None? No questions? Sorry, we had an audio issue. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. All right, fantastic. Well, um, we do have a few questions here, so I will go ahead and start at the very top. Um, our first question is, is it dangerous to show a film or TV show that shows the effects that sexual violence can do to victims or survivors, such as Stockholm Syndrome? Is it dangerous to show a film or TV show clip that shows the effects of sexual violence, um, the potential aftermath of sexual assault? I would say not necessarily. Um, as with anything, it's important that we, again, preempt the discussion with adequate information to frame the clip or the film that we're going to show. And if that is the, the subject that we want to illustrate, um, we should maybe prepare our viewers in advance for what they're going to see or what they should watch for, mm -hmm. you know, and ensure that they're, that they're well prepared um, for that material. All right, thank you. Um, we have another question here. What kind of outreach materials does your organization use to tell clients or the public about your movie and TV show screenings? Oh boy! Um, I mean, we made uh, we created a lot of those documents ourselves. We were for, um, Spotlight. We borrowed a lot of material from the SNAP, the official SNAP website. So, I mean, I don't think we have any internal documents that Family Support Center uses on a regular basis. It kind of depends on the film itself. Right. So if we have, for example, the display that we created for the Oak Queer Film Festival, uh, that was 
generally the same from film to film, but we would also kind of look at the content in the individual films and tailor our materials to, to what the movie was about. So I, I remember there was a documentary about um, uh, conversion therapy, like youth who had to undergo conversion therapy to attempt to very abusively, coercively change their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and so we provided a lot of resources around that topic. Otherwise, when it comes to advertising events, we, I, I, we, we have all the usual tricks. So for the library event, we showed that poster. And again, partnering with a library is awesome because they have access to tons of resources, like maybe their own print shop. And so they helped us make that like full color poster. They cross posted it in their social media. We got it out on social media ourselves. Um, they put a thing in their newsletter about it. Yeah, just utilizing whatever you typically do uh, for other for other prevention um, events that you that you help. All right, great. Um, let's see here. Um, how do you get a blog post published on Huffington Post? <laughs> we were all astonished. I was so proud of her. It's kind of difficult, isn't it? Um, yeah, wow. OK. <laughs> so they do. Okay. All right. Are we still there? Yep. Okay. okay. There is a process um, that you can go through that Huffington Post does take open submissions from prospective community bloggers. I happen to be acquaintances with the, the Queer Voices editor at Huffington Post, who um, is actually from Wisconsin. So I, I had that, that inside connection that I was able to I, I won't say exploit, I will say utilize. <laughs> and he was really on board with the idea. Um, but you know, even if you aren't able to get the reach of Huffington Post, there are still so like local newspapers, um, your agency newsletters, there are lots of opportunities to, to get your words out there. And there are a ton of smaller film blogs or particularly around Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I mean, a lot of advocates are posting articles as well all over the internet. So there's a million ways to get what you have to say out there if you don't end up on something as well known as the Huffington Post, like Amanda was so lucky to be able to do. And it was such a good piece, too, wasn't it? I mean, it was well, a win, a win for the Huffington Post. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, great. Um, our, our next question is uh, what are TV or movie clips you show during presentations to, to teens besides uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower? I, this is going to be a, perhaps a little embarrassing. Again, it's going to maybe take down my film geek credibility, but I've also shown the Lifetime original film, Reviving Ophelia, which gives a pretty accurate portrayal of teen dating violence and domestic violence in a, in a teen relationship. So I found that that was effective without being, we, the, the problem with a clip is that you want it to be age appropriate. Right. So I wanted to demonstrate violence in a teen relationship without being super over the top graphic. So I, I've been known to rely on, on lifetime television, which is a little horrifying. But um, there, there are a lot of, I've used TED Talks, I've used um, clips from a really great feminist speaker named Lacey Green to talk about different types of healthy relationships and consent and, and violence in relationships. So there's, what's important is that you preview it first. And if you're right. working with kids on a regular basis and you know their personalities, um, you shouldn't need parental consent or anything as long as it's appropriate. There's no really bad language. Um, that, that's basically the what I've used thus far. Yeah, speak uh, is one that we mentioned briefly. That there's a young adult novel by that title, um, but it's, it was also to maybe a Showtime movie. It was I don't think it's a 
commercial theatrical release, but uh, it has Kristen um, Twilight, Stewart, Stewart, yes, in it, and it, it's excellent. That's one that we have used clips from in the past, uh, and that's a place, too, where TV shows might be used if there's something that's very self-contained. American Crime might not be appropriate for younger grades, but certainly uh, older high school students, I think we could find material there that would be extremely relevant to their, their life experiences. All right, great. Um, just so folks know, in the uh, chat, I did share Lacey Green's YouTube channel. We'll make sure to get that uh, link out to everyone. Um, like they, like Amanda and Blythe said, Lacey Green has some really, really great videos, especially about sexual violence and rape culture and things like that. Um, we do have another question. Uh, what kinds of primary prevention questions and discussions do you have around film and TV clips rather than just talking about sexual assault and its effects? Primary prevention? Um, maybe if we could get a little clarification on that. What questions do we get from audiences? Um, no, I think that they're asking what kinds of questions regarding prevention. Um, so prevention questions and discussions that you ask, I believe, the audience um, in order to have this discussion about how you use these uh, TV clips and, and movie clips to talk about preventing sexual assault. Right. Um, and again, this is it, it's somewhat tough to to really draw that line um, or emphasize that primary prevention thread for audiences because a lot of what we see dramatized is the aftermath of sexual violence. You know, we, it, it's hard to dramatize preventing sexual assault or promoting healthy relationships. Um, one example I can think of is the discussion following the film Spotlight. Um, we invited the, uh, a forensic interview from the local child advocacy center to be part of our post-film discussion, and we talked about some primary prevention approaches because, of course, people wanted to know how, how can we stop this before it happens? What are some things that we can do to prevent uh, clergy abuse or child sexual abuse in general before it occurs and before it reaches this you know crisis level. Um, so certainly those are some possibilities. You know, as to specific prevention related discussions, I guess if we look like perks of being a wallflower, there's a lot you could do there as well. Um, when Blythe mentioned talking about the like choices and behaviors of some of the characters. Um, did you want to elaborate on that at all? Yeah, when you're using a film, maybe there there's an example of some behavior that you would suggest avoiding, or um, maybe there would be a great example of bystander intervention. Like right. you, you could say, in this next clip, we're going to show a woman who, or a teen who is potentially going to be assaulted and her friend is going to intervene. Let's take a look at how that looks and how you can do that in your own life. Um, so there are ways to use film and television to provide examples and to sort of, I mean, maybe even teach how to prevent these things from happening. Um, it, I think that's, that's the best example that I can think of. Right, yeah. Yeah, sure. So we're talking a little bit about, you know, how, how could the situation in this clip have been avoided? Exactly. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'm really quickly, I'm going to share in the chat box also the Spotlight Discussion Guide that was developed by the Wisconsin Coalition, um, or sorry, Washington Coalition. Is that what I said? I'm not sure. Um, not by us, but by the Washington Coalition. Um, Jess Caney uh, shared that they had a really great film screening guide uh, with questions and everything, and so I found it, so I just shared the link, and I will make sure to send that out to all the attendees as well. Um, I just want to give this space really quickly to see if there are any more questions, because that looks like that was our last one. 
Um, again, while I'm while I'm waiting just to see if any other questions come in, I want to say thank you again so much to Amanda and Blythe. Uh, you guys have some really great knowledge around this area, and you provide such really great concrete examples of what this can look like, and and really great guidance, especially around content notes and things like that. So, I uh, just want to say thank you so much. And we've had a few people type into the questions box to say just thank you for <laughs> for your competence, your compassion, and your literacy, and your your great work. Thank you so much, Jesse, and thanks to everyone who listened. Thank you. I hope we weren't too fast or too annoying. If you if you have any <laughs> or anything that you want to discuss further, please don't hesitate to email or call. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for, for being that resource for people. Um, it looks like there are no more questions. So um, with that, I will say we can end our webinar. Um, again, if you have any feedback about this webinar or about other webinars uh, that WACASA has hosted, please do feel free to contact me. Um, and again, uh, feel free to be in touch with Blythe and Amanda as well on this. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.